And now I'll turn it over to today's moderator, Beth Jones Sanborn, Managing Editor at Hims Media. Thank you, Eric, and welcome everyone. Thank you for attending today's Healthcare IT News webinar, Compliance as Code, Automate Compliance Using Open Source Technology, sponsored by Red Hat. My name again is Beth Jones Sanborn, Managing Editor at Hims Media, and I'll be your moderator today. Security breaches in healthcare have been on a steady rise over the past three years, with PHI becoming a prime target. In addition, financial penalties for HIPAA violations have also been increasing, both in terms of the number of settlements and civil monetary penalties leveled, or levied, rather, and the penalty amounts themselves. Now, in order to protect the PHI data, healthcare organizations must have a solution that's fast, verifiable, repeatable, and secure. To help customers meet this criteria, Red Hat worked with the National Institute of Standards and Technology, or NIST, to develop the Security Content Automation Protocol, also called SCAP, to enable the automated vulnerability management, measurement, and policy compliance evaluation. The leader in open software, uh, or sorry, in open source software offerings, Red Hat named a Red Hat team with Open SCAP to deliver the capability to implement compliance as code. Today's session will review the Open SCAP Compliance as Code offering and how to automate your compliance roster using best practices from Red Hat healthcare, healthcare customers. Our speakers today are Adis Chugtai, who is the Chief Technologist for Healthcare North America, and Sean Wells, Chief Security Strategist at Red Hat. And with that, I'll hand it over to Adis to begin the presentation. Oh, thank you, Beth. Good morning, everyone. Uh, really excited to be here, or good afternoon to folks in the West Coast or wherever you are. Uh, we have basically four specific goals for this uh, presentation that we are going to walk through. Uh, today, I'm going to start off with an overview of HIPAA compliance, the little bit history, and what are the control and regulations specifically surrounding the electronic personal health information and what is your responsibility uh, when it comes to adhering to HIPAA compliance. And then from there, I'm gonna hand it off to Sean Wells, who's gonna talk about the compliance as code, uh, similar to the idea of infrastructure as code, how we can automate and uh, reinforce compliance policy using code to reiterate and reestablish our baseline. Uh, towards the end, I'm going to talk about a security readiness programs that uh, highly encourage you to participate as a way to assess your baseline and what are the areas that uh, Red Hat can help or you as an organization need to address uh, in terms of ensuring your security posture. Uh, more on that towards the end of the presentation. Um, I do encourage everyone to ask questions. Uh, there's no live Q&A uh, per se, but we uh, really wanna make it as interactive as possible and hope you get the value out of this. Uh, to start off, I'm gonna present a poll question uh, to kind of level, help us level set what kind of audience is in attendance uh, so that we can uh, have the right conversation, right information being presented. So with that, uh, the poll question is on your screen. Uh, please take a few seconds to respond uh, and hit the submit button. Uh, the question is, which functionality do you represent in your organization? Are you representing operations, purely security, uh, network operations, application developers, uh, or security um, office uh, as well? All right, thank you everyone for responding. That's pretty fast. Uh, from a response perspective. Uh, so looks like we have uh, more folks represented from security office perspective and then IT operations. Uh, nobody in the audience from network ops uh, as well. So moving forward, we will actually try to tailor the information more relevant to how uh, security office and IT operations could leverage uh, this kind of capability. All right, so let's get started. HIPAA or HIPAA. Uh, I'm just trying to make uh, fun of the fact that uh, 
oftentimes I often misspell HIPAA as well. It's actually Health Information Portability and Accountability Act with two A's, um, which was instituted in 1996 with three major aspects. One was portability. Uh, portability was around the fact that when you switch insurance providers, uh, there are no pre-existing conditions uh, that are enforcing you to switch to another insurance provider where they can say we are not covering this as long as you had previous coverage. So uh, I personally am very thankful for that. Um, second aspect was Medicaid Integ Integrity Program and fraud and, waste, uh, fraud and Abuse. This was essentially to ensure that the integrity program to detect fraud, waste, and abuse in the Medicaid program is continued to be funded uh, and they can operate uh, into the uh, future years. Third aspect was around administrative simplification. This was around standardizing the transaction sets, the exchange between the insurance uh, providers, insurance uh, payers and the providers to standardize on how they're gonna represent uh, code set to identify um, patient with specific diagnosis. Uh, this essentially established the baseline for having a communication, electronic communication that everybody understood uh, by leveraging these code sets. So from that perspective, from that point on, there was also another aspect of HIPAA, uh, HIPAA, HIPAA regulation, which was around ensuring and protecting the electronic personal health information. And these uh, were around three specific areas. One were around administrative, physical, and technical safeguard. So physical safeguard, as the name sounds, it was all around, uh, around protecting the facilities and having proper access and control for authorized uh, users in place. All covered entities or companies that must be HIPAA compliant they must have policies about use and access to the workstations, electronic media, and it also included uh, transferring, removing, disposing, and reusing electronic media uh, that had PHI information on it. Second aspect was around technical safeguard that require access control to allow only authorized access to PHI information. Uh, this included things like, you know, unique user ID, emergency access procedure, automatic log off, encryption and decryption of the data uh, that were essentially mandated as part of that. Additionally, audit reports or report, uh, tracking logs was enforced that must be implemented to keep a record of activity, uh, even on the hardware and software level. This was essentially done to help pinpoint uh, source or cause of any security violations. The other aspect of the technical policies were also to cover integrity controls or measure put in place to confirm the PHI has not been altered in any way. So the integrity controls uh, were things like who accessed the data, what modifications were made to that data, what was the old value and the new value, and what date and time it took place. Uh, these were again done to ensure uh, there's a traceability and accountability to uh, information that has been altered. Uh, last piece of that was network or transmission, transmission security, which is the last technical safeguard required of HIPAA compliant host to protect against unauthorized public access of PHI. This concerns all methods of transmitting data, whether it, it be email over the internet or, or VPN or private network or private cloud. There was a, a supplemental act that was passed in 2009 called the High Tech, the Health Information Technology for Economic and Clinical Health, which supports the enforcement of HIPAA requirement by raising the penalties of health organizations that violate these privacy and security rules. Uh, the high tech was formed in response to health technology development, increased use and storage and transmission of electronic health information as a result of Affordable Care Act, which mandated
meaningful use perspective for everyone to move on to the electronic health record systems. So with having that context, um, I wanted to share some statistics around uh, statistics around the consumption and the software supply chain uh, that is extremely important in consuming and uh, building applications. So if you look at uh, this statistic, there were basically 1,096 new open source pro projects that were launched every day. And if you look at organizations that are consuming open source project, there was about 52 billion downloads of Java, uh, 59 billion downloads of uh, JavaScript from open source um, libraries or, or communities out there. There's 12 billion download of container images from uh, public registry like Docker Hub. And when when this organization looked at the content of these downloads, they found out that there were 84% uh, of them, I'm sorry, they were, uh, several of them had security defects uh, in there. And 84% of these open source projects, because of the nature of the project, they never went back to address those security defects, purely because open source communities are mostly driven towards providing the next best feature and functionality. And holistically, if you look at the statistics, one in 18 downloads could contain at least one known security vulnerability. And I believe everybody on this call probably realizes the common way that organizations are breached are through known security vulnerabilities, not through zero day vulnerabilities, which are unknown and folks failing to patch that. So automated governance and compliance as a code can reduce your defects by 63%. That was one of the measurements that we did uh, through this report. And to put it in perspective, uh, we looked specifically at some organizations that uh, were using open source components. Uh, we found out typical organization had 122,000 components with known vulnerabilities. Uh, 19,000 or 15.8% of them were fixed. But if you look at the time that it took them to fix those known vulnerabilities, the median for those was 119 days. So, especially with PHI being a prime target, and this next slide really talks about that, uh, because the value of PHI information in the underground or the black market or you know the, wherever these stolen records are sold is more than even financial information. Uh, this is a 2016 report that estimated that each record for PHI was being sold for $402. Um, the reason the PHI information is more expensive because you can now file claims against the insurance companies with those with that information, pharmacies, uh, you know, Medicaid or Medicare programs, and it's really hard to detect them uh, by the time an organization is able to detect that these are false claims, you know, sometimes they have paid um, CMS, Center for Medicaid, Medicaid services have estimated in past years that they have paid millions in false claims. Uh, and that's why there was such an emphasis on reducing the fraud based and abuse. In addition, the HIPAA violation penalties, there are four tiers for those, uh, and they go up in terms of fine no, uh, from the fact that if you were unaware and you had HIPAA violation, you, were not, uh, you, you had not known that that has taken place, a minimum fine from 100 to 50,000 per violation, a maximum of 1.5 million per year. Uh, and if you go all the way to tier four, which uh, I hope you are able to read the slide, it's a little bit <laughs> uh, blurred out, but where organizations fail to adequately and knowingly address the HIPAA violation, the fine starts from 50,000 per violation to maximum $1.5 million per year. 
and we have seen a lot of HIPAA violations, fines uh, in terms of Anthem and some others that had breaches uh, that range into millions of dollars. So this is a serious problem, as you all know, for organizations from longevity and risk management perspective. With that, um, I'm going to ask another poll question to kind of get a sense from the audience what has been their biggest challenge in implementing HIPAA uh, compliance policy in your organization. Can you please, please take a few seconds to respond to this question? Uh, so I can, uh, and I'll be happy to share the results with you on the next slide. Uh, I think this will kind of give a good pulse also of uh, what other organizations are facing in, in terms of challenges. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and close poll pretty soon. Okay, still response coming in. Okay, closing the poll in three, two, one. All right, thank you for all those that have responded. Oh, there's some more response, okay. And here's the results. Uh, thank you for all those who responded. So by far, um, number one reason is lack of understanding of HIPAA requirements. Uh, second is technical safeguards. Um, lack of understanding HIPAA requirements, I, I have heard that several times from customers that I have interacted with uh, and not being clearly articulated what they are responsible for. And uh, as you go through this presentation, actually you will have a good appreciation of what uh, Red Hat has been working on to help address actually the lack of understanding and also the automating of implementation of the technical safeguards. Uh, but that's, I think, get a good pulse of the audience. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Sean. Sean, I'm sorry I went a little bit over. No, we're good. So, <clears throat> excuse me, my name is Sean Wells. I work and within our government group to focus on how to, on how to ensure security compliance, whether it's something like HIPAA or NIST or PCI DSS. So we wanted to talk through some of the work we're doing to automate security policies. And <clears throat> through the lens of the poll, there were about 47% asked, how do we understand the requirements better? About 30% asked about technical safeguards. So I'll try and pivot my language to reflect some of that. Um, so to get started then, part of the problem, part of the problem definition maybe is uh, as government and as healthcare moved into trends of digital transformation that required rapid innovation, it's really no coincidence that we saw people like NIST or different healthcare agencies publish their own risk management frameworks. And 
within uh, especially federal health care, this framework brought to mind uh, across government industry, across multiple geographies, and together they formed a set of both both uh, implementation framework as well as best practices. But it, it had some problems, and it, it's nobody's fault that compliance is struggling to keep up. These frameworks are kind of from an earlier era that is pre-cloud and pre-mobile and pre-virtualization, certainly pre-containers, when multiple year dev ship cycles were common and IT was much more manual. But unfortunately, productivity in that era was measured in months, not minutes. And governance, risk management, compliance, well, the GRC market, the software market, is still organized that way. So what's interesting is as we kind of move forward, it's, you know, where does the truth lay? Can, can all of this be automated? Can it not be? Can we provide some clarity? So is the NISP risk management framework as well as the HIPAA framework something that should be reused? Are they compatible with development frameworks like Agile? So we wanted to share some of the work we've been doing with healthcare as well as with government to automate much of HIPAA compliance. So from the poll, um, about a third of everybody said the questions were around technical safeguards and about half for understanding requirements. So I'll kind of build the story through those lenses. And to do that, we ultimately start with the actual policy. Now, whether you start with the HIPAA policies or how they map back to something called NISP 853, which is uh, a requirements catalog, we have these uh, categories of requirements. Maybe they deal with account management or audit events or uh, system integrity. And as we move in, we kind of cherry pick what we want. So maybe the HIPAA baseline enforces unsuccessful logon attempts, but it doesn't ensure that there's a banner when anybody tries to SSH in. We kind of tailor these to what's called a security baseline. And maybe uh, for criminal justice, they have their own selections. And when we move over to HIPAA, you'll see that they're slightly different. And that's what we call a baseline. It's, it's for this conversation, for this webinar, a baseline is really the, the selections of regulatory controls. Um, and as we move in, today, as relates over to Red Hat, we wanted to start with um, understanding mostly the security automation component. And it's, it's not a talk about crypto or, or audit or SE Linux, but mostly about security automation. And in that world, we've created something called Open SCAP. And the idea is it stands for Open Security Content Automation Protocol. But we've worked with federal agencies like NIST as well as healthcare to develop a portfolio of tools and content to assess systems for known vulnerabilities as well as known misconfigurations. So I'll detail a little bit about what that means. And fundamentally, this portfolio of tools is focused on infrastructure operators or the technical staff, the guys and gals with hands on the keyboard. So we wrote automation that allows us to have a security guide generated, meaning if I'm using Linux, I want to know what features of Linux, what security configuration features are relevant to HIPAA. If I'm using middleware, like an Apache web server, I want a security guide tailored for Apache web server that includes and is written to specifically HIPAA. So that's what is called the SCAP security guide. Once we have that baseline, we need to tailor it. So maybe for example, we turn on or off a configuration check or on or off SE Linux. So we have a graphical workbench that works on Linux, Mac, or Windows that allows you to tailor the technical controls for a component. And then there's plugins for configuration management tools that we'll, we'll kind of show and we'll get to. So what we ended up doing is in the true open source way, we don't want to just invent the tool as Red Hat. We actually want to create an entire community around this. So we worked with the government and we've been doing so for almost 10 years. And we, over, the, over literally 10 years actually, 
we've seen the within federal health care and regulatory industries doing like controlled and classified HIPAA um, now actually mandate the use of some of this security content automation, whether it's for governments or whether it's for private health care. And in doing so, they created a national checklist program. So the idea then is can we have the government house a centralized repository of configuration baselines. So that way when I say that I'm going to use Linux or I'm going to operate a container platform or OpenStack or even VMware, I want to go to a .gov website that has authoritative guidance on I'm using Red Hat virtualization, give me the HIPAA baseline, translate the high level requirements like uh, you will do network encryption to very, very specific configuration actions that are tailored to my infrastructure. And that is exactly what the NIST National Checklist Program provides. So we've included a link to where you can find the Red Hat content. And today we've published thing, uh, baselines for HIPAA, PCI, FISMA, FedRAMP, Enterprise Linux, OpenStack, OpenShift, and so forth. And we're, the idea now is to gradually move into a little bit more technical where we'll show how these scans work, we'll show how the automation functions, sample reports, and excuse me, to do that then, we want to remind ourselves that the scanning is not just for vulnerabilities, meaning unpatched software, it certainly is a primary use case but it also has the ability to configure, sorry, to evaluate configuration compliance, meaning are my passwords the right length? Do I have certain configuration settings enabled or disabled? And also in the case that I am failing a configuration check, I want the ability to remediate my system. And when I say remediate, I mean turn a red light to a green light. I wanna, I wanna convert my system to a pass. So we're gonna step through how to do that. And when we begin the conversation, it actually begins with installing the software itself. So the font may be small, but what you're seeing is a screen capture of the installation of Red Hat virtualization. And as we go through the installation, you, Red Hat has delivered pre-configured security profiles. For example, uh, PCI DSS security, Maybe it's the military Department of Defense security configuration baseline or HIPAA. Uh, so the idea then is we no longer have to interpret security policy. When you install things like enterprise Linux or Red Hat virtualization, <coughs> excuse me, you actually deploy directly into a known configuration. And when we deploy, you click the button, you click done, and that's it, that's actually the end, of the, the end of the story. So as we move on then, when the system is installed, you'll actually get an evaluation report. Uh, it looks similar to this, and we'll show the actual results in just a minute here. And the idea is the report will cover HIPAA-specific security settings. So what we've done is translated the high-level HIPAA requirements into actionable and measurable security configuration uh, checks within Linux and other layered technologies. So to help orientate myself uh, kind of over the next 30 minutes or so, I wanted to give a quick, um, quick poll about uh, were you aware of this functionality? And if the majority says yes, we'll pick up the pace. And if the majority uh, was not aware, then we'll kind of slow it down and step through this a little bit more detail. So yeah, just take a couple minutes and hit yes or no. Uh, so kind of while people are, are clicking the button, this feature, or one of the questions that I just got pinged on is how long has this been delivered? So these, Security integrations are actually in the native Red Hat Enterprise Linux installer for RHEL 7. 
as well as Red Hat Virtualization 4, version 4.x. And then we're incorporating it into layered products as well, like OpenStack and OpenShift. And I'll, I'll speak to that in just a minute. Um, so it looks like everybody kind of came in and the, the results were resounding. Most people did not know. So we'll slow it down and that's really good feedback. So I mentioned that you click the button in the installer, it deploys into a HIPAA configuration and what you end up getting, uh, well, this is on a system that was not hardened. <laughs> this is actually from my laptop. But what you end up getting is a report that shows you a compliance score. So uh, we can break this down in a couple interesting ways. The first is rule results. So it's your classic pass or fail. If over roughly 150 checks, my system only passed 47, it failed 100, and two reported unknown, which is that slice of orange on the rear end. Um, so it allows me to just get a really quick synopsis. Outside of that, though, it, it really doesn't tell me enough information. It, it's, okay, well, I, I failed a third of the rules. What does that really mean? And that's where we start highlighting the severity. So we have uh, kind of three categories. High severity, which is a category of vulnerabilities or misconfigurations of which can be remotely exploited. So these would be things like you have SSH or remote login enabled, and you have the ability to log in as the root user remotely with, with no password, super high vulnerability. Medium would be things such as uh, maybe they, there's, there's a, some sort of defense in depth in play where it's not immediately remotely exploitable, but given one or two circumstances, your system or your data could be leaked. And then low or other is kind of the category of good hygiene, where in reality, this is not going to cause you to get hacked, but you should really have your file permissions in order, because if you do, it'll make life hard for, harder for an adversary. Uh, so that's considered low. Outside of that then, you'll notice uh, kind of based on the blending of severity, you get a risk score expressed as a percentage. So a lot of customers requested this, uh, and you'll notice uh, the rule results show that I failed roughly one third of the result, but the score shows that I'm roughly 59% okay. That, that's, that's not really good math. How does that add up? So the score actually demonstrates a, a, a weighted average. So if you fail a high severity check, that is considered uh, more detrimental to your score, and it's a, it's a weighted average. So that's kind of where that comes from. From there, we end up uh, scrolling a little bit down, and I mentioned that each high-level configuration requirement, sorry, each high-level requirement, uh, in this case, NIST 853, ultimately has to be translated to a technology-specific configuration action. So in this case, there's NIST 853 CM5, uh, which may or may not mean anything to you. It's mostly for the federal healthcare side of the house. And you'll note how that high level requirement translates to specific pass or fail configuration checks. But if you fall under the commercial side, uh, you may be following the HIPAA policy directly, in which case you might recognize how this is broken out, where the, the top level requirement is HIPAA 164.308 and a whole bunch of paragraph numbers. That might be more meaningful to you. And again, we've mapped that high level policy to specific configuration actions within the, the component, in this case, Enterprise Linux. Um, in doing so, there are three status reports that get uh, reported. Pass or fail are pretty self-explanatory, but I also wanted to highlight something called not checked. So in certain situations, we see the policy like HIPAA require some security control that cannot be automated. A really good example is what you see on your screen relating to encrypted partitions. And they're not just talking about do, is the operating system encrypting the data. They're generally talking about is the hard drive in the server self-encrypting. And in reality, 
we're not able to evaluate that with any certain degree of provenance or, or a certain degree of assurance. So we acknowledge the check, but we marked it as not checked or not evaluated. So it's one of those things where we want to recognize um, in certain situations, there's, there's a couple of fringe cases where an auditor will have to evaluate something manually. And we just don't want to overpromise that we can automate everything. Um, we try, but there are certain cases that we, that we can't, and we make that clear. So we have our red light or green light. Uh, we know that we pass or fail. And I mentioned we want to turn those red lights into green lights. And to do that, we ship a couple uh, remediation capabilities. So the first is a series of Ansible playbooks, which are provided natively in the operating system, as well as uh, on Ansible Galaxy. And from them, uh, for one, we generate corporately, as Red Hat, playbooks to known security policies, such as HIPAA or PCI DSS or FedRAMP. However, oftentimes a lot of customers use those base Ansible playbooks as a jumping off point to create a tailored security baseline. I mentioned that that's what something called SCAP Workbench is for. So by using SCAP Workbench, you can tailor what security controls are applicable to you. For example, uh, maybe you're running a healthcare system uh, and that's an incredibly high assurance platform. You want to enable all of the security checks. However, maybe you're just running a blog, which does not require, it's not having patient data. So maybe you dial back the security a bit. You, you generate a playbook from a custom baseline. Either way is completely supported. Um, so as we move on, I mentioned that the playbooks are actually delivered natively in Red Hat Enterprise Linux. And there's a whole bunch of them. Uh, believe it or not, we ship them for JBoss Middleware, for Red Hat Fuse, which is a messaging platform, for RHEL 6, for RHEL 7, and as stewards of open source, we actually ship them for other platforms such as Scientific Linux or, or Webman, Wind River Linux, and that's actually something we've been doing for a number of years. By shipping it natively in the operating system, Red Hat has a promise that whatever we ship, we support. So if any of the Ansible playbook is broken, if there are any errors in the SCAP content, it actually, the, the bug fixes follow the standard patching process. You can open a support ticket, we fix it, we give you the fix as a security errata. Um, outside of getting the content, the remediation content from within Linux, we deliver it natively in Ansible Galaxy. And there's a whole bunch of profiles there ranging from criminal justice information systems to the military and of course, HIPAA. So if I were to click on HIPAA, which is the bottom link uh, near the bottom of the screen currently, it, you'll be brought to documentation that gives you, you know, run this command, here's how to download the playbook, here's what you need to change to make it work, put your IP address here, um, that kind of documentation is available. And then again, as Red Hat, everything we do is open source. So if you're inclined to participate, if you find a bug, we certainly, as Red Hat customers, encourage you to open a support case. But absolutely everything is on GitHub, uh, whether it's the HIPAA baselines, whether it's government baselines, it's all on GitHub today. So I wanted to really kind of be strong in emphasizing that point. So. We've talked a little bit about baseline management of things like hypervisors, of things like operating systems, but Optus and I wanted to show a workflow on how this ties together. So if I'm a user in a classic IT environment, maybe you're following ITIL uh, service management basically, you generally have some user create provisioning workflow and they click a button, they want a web server. Behind the scenes, oftentimes large enterprises run something called Red Hat Satellite, which is a system management framework for Red Hat technologies, operating systems, OpenStack, uh, virtualization platforms, and so forth. As the provisioning process goes, 
we have the ability to get a template. Like I wanna, I want the Apache on Rail 7 template. Ansible will go in and configure it, such as maybe you enable PKI or certain Apache modules. And as you move through the workflow process, you'll know that the second to last step is that Ansible Tower has the ability to run a specific job template, such as the SCAP playbook or hardening process. So in doing so, we no longer have security being this tertiary process. By the time a user uh, gets whatever service they need, using the web server example, it's pre-hardened. So the process has, uh, I don't know, component level knowledge of this is Apache, I need the baseline for Apache. And it's going to be running on RHEL 7 and I need to harden RHEL 7. So by the time the service is delivered, all components are pre-hardened. Uh, so we wanted to show that. And then also in the cloud world, oftentimes, you know, in reality, we would absolutely love for every customer to use Red Hat Virtualization or OpenStack. But oftentimes hospitals are going and exploring things like public cloud providers, such as Amazon or Azure or even Google, or perhaps they're on-premise and they need VMware support. So what we've been able to do is uh, Red Hat has something called CloudForm, which is a hybrid cloud management tool that works on-premise and off-premise, public cloud, private cloud, and it becomes the bridge between all of these different environments. So with CloudForm, we actually have the ability to deploy the secure infrastructure in a cloud agnostic way. If you're deploying to EC2, Azure, uh, VMware, it, it actually doesn't matter. We've written this integration already and deliver it today. It's not a roadmap or a feature uh, component at all. So we wanted to share this workflow with you. It turns out most people didn't know, which is why we wanted to have the webinar. Um, so maybe to, to help Asif and I, uh, while we read the Q&A, and prepare for you know kind of the questions and answers. Did this help you? Is this information that was useful to you? Um, if yes, great, click yes. If no, let us be aware of it and then type some questions in the chat that we can go through live. Uh, and for not sure, why don't we treat that as a, as a maybe and just let us know the questions in the chat. So while I am biting for time right now, we're gonna start going through them to, to tee up the live Q&A. Um, so with hey, that. Sean, hey, Sean. Yep. Hey, Sean, uh, I, I thought like it would be helpful to explain what Ansible Galaxy is. You just mentioned that. Um, oh, I, I don't think folks might, might know. No, well, so the question was, what is Ansible Galaxy? So the idea is um, in the same way Docker Hub provides a centralized community space to find playbooks, uh, sorry, to find container images. Ansible Galaxy is a centralized spot to find Ansible playbooks. And the, this term, Ansible playbook, reflects a machine language, a YAML-based machine language that drives a configuration engine so that we can be uh, with a high degree of certainty if you create a Apache playbook that hardens Apache, that deploys a particular version, um, you can share that. And that's what Ansible Galaxy does. So from a Red Hat perspective, we went ahead and provided corporate Red Hat backed, Red Hat engineering supported playbooks for known regulatory baselines, which means that as Red Hat, we go and communicate with regulators, whether it's HIPAA, whether it's auditors like Coal Fire, um, whether it happens to be the, the American Department of Defense for our DOD baselines, we go and translate those baselines into configurations of Red Hat technologies and we make them public through Ansible Galaxy. Uh, and it looks like 100% of people replied. So to flip over to um, the answers, which apparently there is no slide. So uh, the answers as they show up in my view 
are about half the people said, yes, this was really interesting and new information. And the other half said, maybe. Uh, there were no no's. It's kind of on the fence. So we'll start tying up the Q&A. And while I do that, I'll hand it back over to Optus for kind of a review of how we might be able to help with HIPAA audits. Yeah, thanks, Sean. So uh, building on what Sean just mentioned, we actually, in partnership with Intel, have launched a program that allows you to kind of assess your security readiness. What this program is, right now we have about 150 healthcare and life sciences organizations uh, participating in it globally. And what this program is really is a way to measure your organization against your peers and how are you ranking against other healthcare organizations that uh, are looking at their security postures. Uh, this does span nine countries. And what this program is, is basically a one hour interview with you guys uh, with the specific uh, template of questions that we will ask. This template captures you know, your level of concerns, what are your high level priorities, and then measure against specific 38 security controls in healthcare organizations and how you grade against those security breach, uh, security controls that have resulted in breach. And what we do is actually put it into this uh, program that takes your answers and generates a report that allows you to grade yourself or grades you against the, uh, your peers and gives you also recommendation on based on the priorities that you have uh, identified, what are the first things that you should be addressing. And it also provides actually links to certain technologies that you could look at to consume to quickly address um, those security controls that have been identified. I, I think the cool part is that every once a quarter, you can refill out this template and give it back to us and we will run it again and it will give you the updated results on in terms of how you you are tracking against what your initial log and now what it is it's currently Uh, so I highly recommend uh, engaging us and reaching out to us on this program. It's a good, good way to get started on, on prioritizing what are the areas that you want to address. and. <laughs> identify controls uh, that you want to address uh, first in terms of protecting your organization. So with that, we have about 10 minutes for question and answer. And uh, what I will recommend actually in order to reach out for this program, please reach out to this email address, uh, kpark at redhead.com, kpark at redhead.com. And you can uh, download these slides and uh, also get the email that way. So at this point, uh, we'll move on to the questions. Thank you. And just as a reminder uh, for our listeners today, um, our participants, uh, you can continue to submit questions throughout the Q&A by using the Ask a Question panel on your screen uh, just to the left of the slide. And so for the first question, uh, where do we generate the report? Do you have a tool included with Red Hat Enterprise products? Uh, so this is Sean. I'll jump in and take that one. 
So there are a couple different ways to generate the report. The very first one is classic Red Hat in that there are command line tools for system administrators. Uh, clearly that only works on a one-to-one -one basis. It's, it's not really how to scan a hundred systems. So to scan at scale, we expose this functionality through both Red Hat Satellite, which is our system management tool, as well as Red Hat Cloud Forms, which is a hybrid cloud uh, kind of service management platform. So you can do it one-on-one, -on -one, such as a system administrator may. We can do it at scale, such as through Red Hat Satellite, and we can do it across cloud providers, public or private, through cloud forms. Any of them are completely supported right now. Yeah, and I would add to that, I would add to that that with cloud forms specifically, you have the capability to implement uh, workflow. So if you did use cloud forms to do the scan and it generated the report and you want to use the Ansible playbook to kickstart the remediation process, uh, you probably don't want to immediately go and touch the production servers or servers which are running mission critical workload. You probably want to go through some approval process, uh, ensure that app owners are aware these controls are going to be in place. So Cloud Farms is a great way uh, to actually implement uh, that organization workflow in enabling and uh, executing these security controls. Okay, our next question, it, uh, are the SCAP and Ansible content supported by Red Hat? They are, so the, uh, we have two levels of support, so I'll answer thoroughly. The first is, I'm interpreting this as can I open a ticket and can I call 1-800-RED-HAT and if something's broken, will they talk me through it? The answer is yes, absolutely. Um, the second is if something's broken, will you patch it? So uh, the answer to that is yes. If there are any errata or uh, missing features, if something is, is incorrect, we actually deliver through RPMs updates to the content as well as the tools. So yes, absolutely, completely supported. Okay, and what validation does the content go through? Oh, I, that's actually a really good question. Um, so I mentioned briefly something called the NIST National Checklist Program. And what, uh, what NIST, sorry, the role of the government in this national checklist is to review vendor submissions. So that when Red Hat says HIPAA policy number 1234 maps to the following operating system level configuration, they peer review that to make sure our interpretation of the policy is correct. They peer review it to make sure that our implementation of the control is correct. And then they also take a look at our automation technologies like the actual uh, Ansible and SCAP code to ensure that we're not reporting false positives or false negatives. And that is done um, and indicated when it is complete on the NIST website. So it allows you to say, oh, the, the vendor just uploaded this yesterday and it's not reviewed. Maybe I wanna hold off for a week or two until NIST gets a chance to review it. And it allows you to be a little bit more informed. Okay, uh, we're down to our last couple questions. So again, a reminder to our participants today that if you did have any other questions you wanted to ask, uh, to please enter them in the uh, ask a question bar. Uh, so how much of this workflow is accessible through an API? I still think that too. So both satellite and cloud forms have REST APIs. And as long as you can make a REST call, you can access this functionality through an API. So I suppose the, the question is really asking, will it fit into existing automation workflows? Will it fit into custom tooling? Um, as long as your workflow or, or custom automation supports REST APIs, the answer is yes. That, is, that APIs are included. Okay, great. And final question, uh, how long does it take to complete the assessment and will you provide a questionnaire ahead of time so that a client can prepare? 
Yeah, so I'll take that one. Uh, so typically it takes one hour to go through the interview questions to fill out the template and capture your priorities and concerns. And obviously the, that template will be provided ahead of time uh, for you to review and digest uh, and maybe even gather information to answer some of those questions. Uh, we have found uh, in previously with other customers that you know it's a pretty pain-free process and it's pretty quick and the results are you know appreciated in terms of uh, identifying where they should prioritize uh, their efforts in securing the organization and meeting HIPAA compliance. Okay, so it looks like that was our last question. So at this time, um, Sean or Atis, if, if either one of you has have any final comments um, that you'd like to make at this time, uh, please feel free to do so. Yeah, so I'll, I'll go first. Uh, so I do understand the complexities behind HIPAA can be very daunting and uh, the nebulous uh, information that exists on the internet and uh, reading through the policy could be could be a painstaking task. Uh, I, I do believe that you know that is essential for our uh, security and protecting our PHI information. Uh, so it is should be a priority. One of the things that were submitted as a direct question to us uh, was um, lack of executive support as one of the uh, possible reasons why uh, uh, organization not uh, are far along this path. I mean, lack of executive support uh, should clearly be addressed through the paramount of fines uh, that exist in not addressing HIPAA compliance. Uh, that should change pretty quickly after you share that information. Sean. Um, no, so I guess the biggest thing is we talked a lot about infrastructure. So the goal is to have components like hypervisors be compliance ready out of the box. So the idea is you deploy into a known state and then you have tools and content to do continuous monitoring over a period of time, like a year or just during your normal life cycle. Uh, so we provide out of the box compliance with continuous monitoring. And, and that's kind of what makes it so unique is as we add regulatory baselines, we open source them and put them natively in the technologies so that it, it doesn't become the customer responsibility to define HIPAA for a hypervisor or to define HIPAA for a container platform. We take care of that. And then there was a, a question I just noticed uh, that we did not answer in the chat about are we aware of uh, templates security templates and checklists that cater to the Canadian HIPAA uh, requirement? And oh, sorry about the answer that. is no. I must have missed that. <laughs> oh, no, no, it, it just popped up. So the answer is no, I am not aware. But what's nice is that we can add them quite easily. So I would suggest um, we put our emails in here, send an email to Atif, Kendall, or myself, and we can take that one offline to figure out how to do it together. And Sean and Adif, just to draw your attention to another question you may want to take offline that just popped up. Uh, as part of compliance, if you need to go through multiple computers, what, is the act, what are the access requirements to scan those, and what is the typical time to scan one computer? So if you wanted to jump on that um, offline as well, the, the person asking the question is listed there as well, um, if you wanted to make sure that that point got addressed. Yeah, it seems like there's a couple here and there. So as people ask yeah. questions,